go ahead and read <clears throat> the text. I just want to read the um, uh, three verses that we're going to be looking at, verses 21 through 23 of uh, Matthew chapter 7. And again, <clears throat> one of the things we need to guard against that we saw last time, which I'm also going to reiterate again, uh, we need to guard ourselves against false teachers, those that would take words like these and make them either irrelevant or try to lessen the impact of them and to, to basically tell us that it's not really anything to be concerned about. Uh, these are words we need to be concerned about, everything that the Lord tells us, uh, things that we need to, to, to weigh very carefully. And certainly these words this morning. So this is what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 7. And remember, these are the words of the one who is God and man, the one who is reigning in heaven, the one before whom we're going to have to stand someday and give an account of our lives. We, the, these are his words. So let's, let's give him the attention and the respect that he deserves. This is what he says. And beginning in verse 21, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons and in your name perform many miracles? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Well, may the Lord bless His words to our understanding, to our, well, our, our conviction. May He search us with these words and may He use them to build us up in the truth. Now, as I mentioned before, as Jesus is coming to the end of this sermon, remembering that He's speaking to a mixed multitude, He was directing these words to His disciples. He sat down on the mountain, they came to Him, He began to teach them. But there was also a huge crowd of people who were there. And Jesus, of course, was aware that they were listening to him as well. And so he is also speaking to them. But again, he's speaking to those who know him and those who don't know him. So at the end of the sermon, he's issuing four challenges or four tests to help them benefit, to help us benefit from what it is he's already told us. Now, the first challenge had to do with what road uh, we're actually on. Jesus tells us that there are only two. There is a broad and an easy road on which the vast majority of the people of this world are walking. It is the road that everyone is born on. As a matter of fact, that's the road we were born on until we got onto the narrow road. And that most people in this world are still on. Just about everybody we see every single day in our neighborhoods, at work, on the street, in the news and other media, TV and movies, virtually all of them, not all of them perhaps, but, but the vast majority of them, are on this road that Jesus tells us leads to destruction, leads to hell. Jesus told us there is also a narrow road on which very few walk, a road that only has one door that opens to it, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Remember, Jesus said, we can only come to the Father through Him, by believing Him, by receiving Him. Jesus said that this road is not only has a narrow gate that leads to it, but it's, an all, it's also a difficult road. It's narrow in the sense that it's restricting and that it's a difficult kind of life to live. Remember, John Bunyan said this about the, the narrow passage through the wall that represents the narrow way to the Lord. As he tried to squeeze his way through it, he realized there was only room for body and soul, but not for body and soul and sin. The reason why this road is difficult to walk is because it doesn't allow us to allow ourselves to sin. It is a road of holiness. But this is the road, Jesus says, that leads to life. It is the road that leads to heaven. Now, Jesus warns us that we can only arrive at the destination the road that we're on actually leads to. If we want to arrive in heaven, we have to be on the narrow road. We have to go through the narrow door, and we have to walk on this road. We have to live this kind of life. So the question Jesus asked us first was, is this the road that we're actually on? 
Now, the second test had to do with those who presume to tell us about this road. We noted that one thing there has never been a shortage of in the history of the church are those who claim to teach us the truth about what the Bible actually says. Now, Jesus warns us against those who would misrepresent it, who would widen the door or perhaps create other doors, tells us, who would tell us that there are many paths that actually lead to God, that all religions are like so many spokes in a wheel that all lead to the same hub, that Jesus isn't the only way. That's a lie. There is only one way. And he warns us against those who would try to widen the path and make it easier to walk on it, who would either set aside maybe one or all of God's commandments, and there are people even within the church that do this, or would reinterpret the commandments to make them easier to keep. Now, I don't know if you remember, but Jesus addressed this very thing in the Sermon on the Mount, and he warned us against it. He says in Matthew 5, verses 18 and 19, For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or stroke shall pass from the law until all is accomplished. And essentially it is until the full plan of God has come to pass. Whoever then annuls one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven, but whoever keeps and teaches them shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. You know, we tend today to say that somebody who keeps and teaches everything the Lord says is just being picky and a stickler. You know, just, you're being too strict. You're being too particular. As a matter of fact, there was that famous story about the Puritan. I think it was John Rogers who was on horseback and he went past this, uh, this manor. And the Lord of the manor came out to him and he recognized him and he started basically accusing him of these things, telling him he was being too strict, he was being, being too uh, picky. And then he said, he stopped and he kind of thought about it and he, he, he said to, to John Rogers, he goes, you know, I, I realize you're, you're a good man in many other ways, but why are you so strict? And he says, oh sir, I serve a strict God. You know, God is very particular about how we live and, and we need to listen to what he says. I mean, listen to what Jesus said. He said what he said for a reason. He wants us to live in a particular way. The door and the path are narrow because there is really only one right way. And as Jesus reminds us, it's not an easy way. Now, many of these teachers might be well-meaning. They might really believe that what they're telling us is true and that what they're saying uh, will really help us. They might even be friends, friends of ours. But if what they say leads us off, the right road. The end result is still going to be the same. We need to be on <clears throat> our guard. So Jesus tells us, examine them. Examine their fruit. Compare what they say with the Word of God. Does it agree or does it not agree? Are they telling us what God actually says or are they telling us something else? Jesus said, look at their lives. Are they like Jesus or are they not like Him? And then He said, look at those who are listening to them. Are they becoming more like Jesus or are they becoming more like the world? That's how we can distinguish the true prophets from false prophets or those who declare the truth versus those who don't. Now we come this morning to Jesus' third test. Again, there's only one road that leads to life and we need to be careful to listen only to those who teach us the truth. The next question that he asks us is this. Are we actually walking on this road? Are we actually doing the will of God? Are we more than Christians by profession only? And how can we know? Well, obviously we can know by the fact that we are doing more than just simply talking about Christianity, more than simply talking the good talk. We all like to talk about the things of the Lord. But are we also walking the good walk? Are we doing what the Lord calls us to do. Now listen, Jesus challenges us this morning that if we want to enter into heaven, we have to do more than just simply call Him Lord. We actually have to surrender to Him as our Lord. We do need to obey Him. Now Jesus tells us first that it's not enough to call Him Lord. 
It's not enough merely to claim that we belong to him, <clears throat> that we are his followers, that we are his servants, if we hope eventually to enter into heaven. Notice what he says in verse 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, again, these are the people who are claiming to belong to him. Now, Jesus certainly means for us to apply this to the false teachers that he warned us about last time. Remember, he called them wolves in sheep's clothing, which means outwardly they were claiming to belong to him. They were among those who called him Lord, but they didn't really know him. Jesus says they were like wolves. They were his enemies. They were the enemies of the sheep. They're the ones that devour the sheep. They're the ones we need to watch out for. So being wolves, they were a real threat to his sheep, a real threat to us. Jesus told us not to take their claim at face value, but to look and see if their claim was actually true. Are they teaching according to the Word of God? Are they living according to the Word of God? Are they helping other people to live according to the Word of God? We will know them by their fruits. Not everybody who says, Lord, Lord, is going to enter the kingdom of heaven. But Jesus intends for us as well to apply this to ourselves because it doesn't apply just to false prophets. It applies to everyone. He wants us to examine our lives to see whether or not we also are sheep or whether we're wolves, whether we're actually on the narrow road and so will enter into heaven. Jesus wants us to know that a bare profession of faith is not enough. It's not enough to say, I'm a Christian. It's not enough to join with a church. It's not enough to stand and take membership vows, to claim that we love him and that we are going to submit to him no matter what the cost. It isn't enough even to insist that this is true. You know how things in Scripture, when Jesus wants to emphasize something, he says it twice. These people are, are going to say to him on that day, Lord, Lord, which means they're insisting that Jesus is their Lord. And yet Jesus says they do not belong to him. Now, Jesus also wants us to know that even if we could add to the confession that he is our Lord, if we could add to that even the greatest spiritual gifts, their possession and their use in our service to him, that still would not be enough. Jesus says in verse 22, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons and in your name perform many miracles? Now, Jesus says even that would not be enough. Even that would not prove that they actually belong to him. Now, the reason why it wouldn't is because of this, that when the Lord was actually giving these abilities to his disciples, which we noted last time we believe he isn't doing today, but even in those days when he was, he didn't give them just to people that were his, but he also gave them to people who didn't belong to him, people who were not true believers. Now, maybe some of us haven't heard that before, but it's actually true. Paul writes, for instance, in 1 Corinthians 13, verses 1 and 2, if I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but do not have love, I have become a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and know all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith, so as to remove mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. Now, why would Paul even posit the possibility of this if it wasn't possible? He's saying it is possible. What he's saying is this. It, it was possible supernaturally to speak in another language. Speaking in tongues isn't babbling, but it's actually speaking a language that is known on the earth. If... Uh, well, let's just say if it was possible to do that and to preach the word and to predict the future. Remember, prophecy has two different aspects to it. It's um, foretelling or declaring the word of God. It's also foretelling what God is going to do in the future. It's, it's possible to speak in another language. It's possible to prophesy. It's possible to know things. 
that you couldn't possibly know unless it had been revealed to you by God and to have faith to move mountains. Jesus said it was possible to do that, Paul says, but still not be acceptable to him, to be a noise in his ears or as nothing in his eyes. Now again, remember King Saul at one time was actually numbered with the prophets and Balaam was a seer of God and yet both of them were actually killed in his judgments. Judas was numbered with the twelve. Jesus sent him out to preach with the others equipped with the power to heal the sick and to raise the dead and as a matter of fact he did those things but he was never more than a devil. Now Jesus tells us that many are going to come to him uh, on that day and are going to say, Lord, Lord, didn't we do all these wonderful things? And he doesn't say he's going to dispute with them the fact that they did it. But rather, he's going to say, having done these things, there were those among them who really did not know him. He says that he will reject them. That's all he says. He doesn't question whether or not they did these things. He says in verse 23, and then I will declare to them, I never knew you. So if, if claiming to be a Christian, if claiming Jesus as your Lord and your Savior, claiming to be his follower and his servant, even having and using the charismatic gifts and preaching the gospel isn't enough to enter the kingdom of heaven or to prove that you're actually a believer and will enter the kingdom of heaven, well, what is enough? Well, Paul already told us what, what is enough in 1 Corinthians 13, verses 1 and 2. He says, if I do these things but I don't have love, then I am nothing. We must have love. The love that every true believer has and will have, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13, long after the gifts have ceased, when our faith has basically become sight and what we've hoped for has finally become reality. Jesus tells us that we need a love in our text this morning that goes beyond just saying that he is our Lord to one that actually submits to him as Lord in every area and at all times. Now, listen again what Jesus says in verse 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven, will enter. Now, you've heard me say before, and actually um, uh, in that 1 John 3 passage where it talks about the practice of sin, nobody who practices sin knows God, there is in the Greek language different tenses. In, you know, verbs have different tenses even as we do in the English language. And when the present tense is used in the Greek, it often refers to an ongoing action. It refers to a pattern of life. And that's what Jesus is actually talking about here. We could translate it this way to kind of bring that out. The one who is doing, the one who continues to do or repeatedly does the will of my Father who is in heaven, that is the one who is going to enter into heaven. Jesus says that it's this kind of obedience that actually sets us apart from those who merely claim Jesus as their Lord, but who really don't know him. Jesus will say at the judgment to those who don't know him, in verse 23, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Okay, here again, the idea of that present tense, the one continually doing what is wrong. Those, Jesus says, who don't know him, who do not have a personal relationship with him, Jesus says, I, it's not that I don't know who you are. I mean, Jesus knows who we are. He'll know who we are on the day of judgment. But I don't know you in a personal way. Those who don't know Jesus in a personal way, who haven't come through the narrow door, haven't trusted in him, come to the Father through faith in his name, they're not walking on the narrow road, they're walking on the broad road. They do not practice righteousness, they don't do what's right as a pattern of life, but they practice lawlessness. They do what is wrong in God's eyes. I don't know if you can see this, but Jesus is talking about everything in groups of two. There's always two of everything, two roads, two kinds of preachers, uh, two responses to the Word of God, two foundations on which we can build, two conclusions 
of our lives. Well, there's only two kinds of people in the world, aren't there? Those who know him, those who don't. Those who are in the kingdom of heaven, those who are in the kingdom of darkness. Jesus tells us that we can tell them apart by how they live. Those who belong to him, obey him. Those who don't belong to him, disobey him. Isn't that exactly what John told us in 1 John chapter 3? Let's read that again, the meditation we looked at this morning. No one who is born of God practices sin because his seed abides in him and he cannot practice sin because he is born of God. And I want to make sure you understand what he's saying here. He's not saying you don't sin. He's not saying you don't sin repeatedly, that you don't struggle with sin. What he's saying is there is no sin that you have embraced, you know is wrong, but you're unwilling to give it up and you continue to do it. That's what it means to practice sin. Every true believer sins. We struggle against sin. As a matter of fact, John said earlier in 1 John, if we say we have no sin, we're lying. We're deceiving ourselves. We're calling God a liar because we actually do sin. This has to do with the practice of sin. But then he goes on to say this, by this the children of God and the children of the devil are obvious. Anyone who does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor the one who does not love his brother. I mean, Jesus told us on that final day when we stand before him at the final judgment, that is what he's going to use to determine whether or not we know him, to divide between the sheep and the goats. How does Jesus know to do that? Well, of course, he knows those who are his, but it's obvious not just to him. It's also obvious to others because the sheep are doing his will. The goats are not. So how can we know that we're on the narrow path that leads to life? Well, we can know by the fact that, as Paul says, we love him. And we can know that we love him because we listen to him and we do what he says. Jesus says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And also in the parable of the sower, there's been a lot of debate, you know, as to how many of these soils are actually converted people. Well, the only soil that actually represents a converted person is, is the fourth, where the plants actually grow up and bear fruit. You know, there has to be fruit. Jesus says in John chapter 15, any branch in me that doesn't bear fruit is cut off and it's thrown into the fire. But every branch that bears fruit is pruned by the Father so that it may bear more fruit. Well, Jesus says regarding the fourth soil, in the parable of the sower in Luke 8, verse 15. But the seed in the good soil, these are the ones who have heard the word in an honest and good heart and hold it fast and bear fruit with perseverance. In other words, they don't just say, Lord, Lord, but they, they do what God calls them to do. Now, again, Jesus is not teaching us here that we must save ourselves by doing good works. You know, Paul says all who are under the works of the law are under the curse because cursed is everyone who doesn't continue in everything written in the law to do it. Our works earn exactly nothing towards our justification. As a matter of fact, they're strikes against us rather than helping us because there is no one who is perfect and doesn't sin. That's not what Jesus is saying here. He's telling us that if we have been justified, if we've trusted him, received him as our savior, if we have entered through the narrow gate, we will do good works, we will obey him, we will walk on the narrow path, even though it's difficult, no matter what the cost may be to us personally in the same way, that Jesus did. Because remember why Jesus came into the world? He didn't come into the world just to save us from the guilt of our sins so we wouldn't go to hell, but he came to save us from the power of our sins, to set us free from sin so that we might walk at liberty, so that we might become like him, so that we might obey. He's written the law of God on our hearts so that we would love it and do it. So Jesus challenges us this morning to, to basically step back and take a good look at ourselves. Are we obeying him? Now again, Jesus isn't asking us if we agree with him, if we agree with what he says, if we approve of what he says, if we talk about what he says, if we spend a lot of time learning about what he says. That's not what he's asking here, but he's asking, are we actually doing 
what He says. Are we doing it in every area of our lives? Are we doing it at all times? Is that what we're striving for? Now, again, He's not asking us if we're perfect because none of us here are perfect. None of us here will be perfect on this side of heaven. But He is asking us this question, do we want to be perfect? Are we striving to be perfect? Do we want to be more like Jesus? Now, Jesus is perfect. And if we want to be like Jesus, then perfection is really what we want. Is that what you want to be like Him? If we have the Spirit, if we have the new nature, this is what we will want and this is what we will be doing. That's what Jesus tells us. If that isn't, what you find in your own heart this morning, then you need to look to Jesus and ask Him to change your heart, to give you His Holy Spirit to work that love in you so that you might follow Him, that you might enter through the narrow door and that you might walk on the road, the only road, the narrow, difficult road, the road of self-denial and obedience that actually leads to heaven. Well, may the Lord help us to see ourselves accurately and to judge accurately, particularly as we prepare to come to the table, because remember, the table is for those who have entered the narrow door, who are trusting in Jesus, and who are going beyond just saying, Lord, Lord, but are actually doing the will of His Father who is in heaven. So let's, let's bow for just a moment of prayer, and let's ask the Lord to search our hearts. Let's ask the Lord to prepare us to come to the table, let's be prepared to repent of the sins that he actually shows us that we're guilty of and purpose in our hearts to follow him no matter what the cost and to walk on this road. Then as we come to the table, we'll find that the Lord will meet us here and he will give us the grace we need, the strength we need actually to do this. So this, this prayer is going to be not only our, our prayer where we ask the Lord to apply what we've seen, but also to prepare us to come uh, to the table. Well, let's, let's bow for a moment of prayer then, shall we?